Welcome to Holywell Gardens. I'm Graham Cole. I'm the head gardener here and we manage the whole gardens using stock-free organic methods. That don't involve any exploitation of animals. No blood, fish and bone, no animal manures, no chemical sprays, no chemical fertilizers. We grow food here and can produce fresh produce all the year round, every day of the year. And we're going to show you from whether it's a window box through to a large allotment or a modest garden that you can actually produce food using these methods. grow a wide range of crops here, lots of different vegetables from potatoes through to brassicas, roots like carrots, lots of salads, tomatoes, but also quite a lot of fruit, a lot of different exotic fruits like peaches, nectarines, figs, but I would like to also introduce people to soft fruits which I believe are very, very important and very easy to grow. We produce fertility as much as we can on site and we believe this is the most ethical and sustainable way of producing food from farm to garden. Stock Free Organic is the most sustainable and ethical system of growing. It's far more sustainable than current conventional methods of growing which rely on oil-based fertilisers and livestock use which involves vast amounts of land and water and even then we import food from other countries to feed those animals. There are a lot of problems associated with conventional farming like deforestation, water pollution, soil erosion and all these things can be addressed by cutting out the use of livestock and chemicals. We can produce fertility on site, closing the loop of fertility without bringing it in from somewhere else and stealing it from somewhere else. There are various methods that we can use to, to produce our fertility, even on the poorest soil, whether it's on gardens, allotments and large farms. It's using compost and other plant materials, leaf mould and particularly green manure crops. We know this works commercially and we know it can work on the garden scale. The benefits of stock free organic are several. We're working out in the fresh air the nutritional benefits of the food that's had a short distance from soil to plate, the safety aspect for the family of the no pathogens from livestock manures or chemical residues and sprays. And it's a lovely place to work out in the fresh air when it's not raining. <laughs> and we can actually produce a lot of food all the year round. Moving on from the sustainability of Stock Free Organic is the wider community, be it a village, town or city, and how we actually uh, produce our food and our energy and other things in the future. And there is the transition movement which is aiming to address this, which will actually create far more secure and sustainable communities in the future. And we feel that with Stock Free Organic, it would do very much this. Um, it's all about bringing things to the local level and um, involving local people. We're not so dependent on bringing things from far afield, you know, not just further up the country, but the other side of the world. We would also suggest from a growing point of view that certain crops would be grown in some areas that are appropriate to those areas. And we would free up a lot of land on a plant-based diet. So sustainability would come from the transition movement and what it aims to do, and from what we propose. And now, we are going to explore these methods and you can see how we can do it. Right, into another part of the garden. We are actually now talking about fertility, building fertility, and we start with green manures. This bed behind us, with the brassicas growing, have followed an overwintering crop of trefoil. 
Trefoil is one of several green manure crops that fix nitrogen from the air. Green manures produce a lot of roots that bring up minerals from the ground, particularly the nitrogen fixers like clovers and trefoil will give us a long period of covering the soil in the winter which will stop the leaching of nutrients. Other green manures that don't fix nitrogen are also beneficial. They'll hold on to nutrients and nitrogen will be mopped up. Trefoil is particularly good at smothering the soil and it's turned in about two weeks before the following crop is planted. Other parts of the garden use green manures and some are actually under sown, like trefoil, which will take some shade. Green manure seed is widely available. It's even in garden centres now, so it's easy to get hold of. Our second fertility builder is compost, which is very familiar to a lot of people. A wide range of materials will make a very good compost. Very important, um, heart, the heart of the garden, really. Um, the reason why it's so important is that it's a way of recycling waste plant materials and our kitchen waste and turn them into use, usable nutrients for our, for our crops later on. Um, the time that it takes can vary, but it, the importance of it is that we actually feed the soil, we're not feeding the plants directly, we're feeding the soil and building that up so that everything is so much healthier. How you start to make it, uh, you have to have a good quantity of material to begin with, a good varied quantity to begin with, of green waste, which is kitchen waste, grass mowings, soft stems and harder stems, but nothing too woody, and then a brown waste, which would be straw, shredded paper, shredded cardboard to give a bit more fibre and absorb some of the moisture and we need to retain the heat. The heat is very important so solid sides, um, the one here is made from wood of course um, but there are other materials and covering it, I cover it with black polythene and that keeps the heat in and stops it from getting too wet and too dry. Well compost is very valuable around the garden particularly for the heavy feeders like potatoes and sweet corn and tomatoes um, we can use, uh, if we have enough of it, we can use it for our beans. Squashes and courgettes benefit from it because of the moisture and as well as the nutrients, holds a lot of moisture. So it's wherever you can use it, but not where we're growing roots. Um, but most things will benefit from it in containers or the heavy, heavy croppers. Well, we can never make enough compost and some of us may actually only be able to make a small amount or none at all. So the other thing that could be considered is uh, municipal green waste, which is um, processed, composted and is sold by most local authorities. Um, its nutrients var vary, so it, it's not often, it can be good, but it may not often be the same quality as a bought uh, multi-purpose compost, but it's something to be considered. You could even mix it with a, with a, a bought compost. But it's still a very useful way of making use of a, of a, a potentially wasted resource that's actually been recycled. And it's a very good soil conditioner. It's very good on the garden and in the greenhouse. Leaf mould is also used here. We have many leaves, so we utilise them. And they're a good soil conditioner and also a very good mulch in the winter. We put a blanket on in, in, in a lot of places. These brassicas will actually have a blanket of leaf mould put on in the autumn.
and then finally trip branchwood, which is the, the end of the branches of, of, of a tree where they can't use the logs, can't use the wood for logs, and also hedging, hedging trimmings. Various stages of this as it breaks down are used. When it's fresh, it's used as a very good mulch and a fertility builder for long-term humus and carbon in the soil. When it's well rotted, it's good in potting mixes and incorporating to the soil or just using again as a mulch. So these are the four main ways that we build fertility in this garden. The second thing about stock-free systems is rotations. A rotation system is where plants are moved around the garden. They don't occupy the same place year on year, so you do not get problems with build-up with pests and diseases. And they take different things from the soil. Different plants take different things from the soil. So the first year of the crop rotation here is potatoes. These follow an overwintering green manure, which we use as trefoil. The second year is peas and beans. They benefit from the compost that's added before the potatoes are planted. And then after the peas and beans are the brassicas, which is Brussels, broccoli, kale. The fourth year is the roots, which take less from the soil. And then we're back to the first year of the rotation. There are other marginal groups of crops, like the herbs, sweet corn, and the lettuces, the salad crops. They can be utilised within spaces and between rows so that it's not totally rigid. We can actually incorporate other things and fast growing things like radishes. So rotation is also a very important part of the system. Another element of uh, stock free organic is biodiversity. Now biodiversity in itself is important to encourage to encourage more wildlife, the plants and the birds and the, the mammals and the insects. But we actually get some benefits from this ourselves. For example, we can encourage hoverflies in by growing perennial plants like lavender and annuals that encourage hoverflies which eat green fly. We can also provide habitat for amphibians and ground beetles to eat slugs. We can actually be less tidy, we can leave areas that are more wild, we can let the grass grow up, we can let wild flowers grow up and keep nettles growing in, in various areas, which are all beneficial for butterflies and bees. And in itself, this benefits the health of the garden. We get less pest problems, we don't have to use the sprays because we're relying on the natural balance and the predators. And we know it works here because we have very few pest problems. Weeds are a reality in a garden, we're disturbing the soil, but we can control them and there are various ways we can do this. And in the summertime, this is my favourite tool, the hoe. This will hoe off annual weeds very, very quickly and effectively and on those hot sunny days, they'll shrivel and die when they're very small. Perennial weeds, which will come up every year, can be more of a problem. I mean, digging is the first thing, like a dandelion, for instance, you can dig up. But if you have more persistent weeds, like bindweed, where they go down a long way, well, like us here, we just live with it. We're not using 
artificial weed killers. So we're just digging and mulching. Mulching is the other solution really because that can stop a lot of the annual weeds growing. The materials that I mentioned earlier like leaf mould and chip branchwood can be very effective in this. But weeds are a plant in the wrong place so we're always going to have them but there are ways of dealing with them to stop them crowding out our vegetables and our food. So here we are in the large greenhouse at Holywell. Um, the greenhouse can be much smaller than this, you can consider a cold frame. They're very, very useful places to start plants off. You're protected from the extremes of the weather. You can get things going earlier and you can extend the season. In fact, you can go right through the winter without heat. In the UK, with a frame or a greenhouse, you can actually fill it with plants such as rocket, winter lettuce, parsley, winter purslane, many things that will actually grow without heat. And it's a place you can start off plants. They'll actually be more robust for planting out later so they're less likely to fail. You can sow in here and then pot on and plant out. On my right here are tomatoes growing in an animal-free, organic, chemical-free medium. And these mediums are coming onto the market more so, and more so in the future. And they're a very good way of actually raising plants that fits in with our ethical and environmentally friendly criteria. So greenhouses and frames are something to seriously consider on your plot. Well here we are in another part of the garden. We have over half an acre here but you don't need that much uh, land to produce a useful amount of food. Um, and even containers can be considered if you haven't even got a lot of land. Um, window boxes, window sills, but containers on a patio for instance. You, you don't need um, the large uh, spaces. Uh, you can make use of vertical spaces. And also where you are is very important that you get shelter. Um, most vegetables will only grow with a lot of light and a lot of sunshine, you need a good proportion of the day with sunshine and light. There are a few fruits that can be grown on north facing aspects or sh more shady gardens, but we can actually definitely say that most vegetables will need a lot of light. Um, if you have a garden that's, that's sheltered, that will keep out the wind, or if you can get more shelter up, because wind, wind can be a problem, we're on a windy day today. Um, and sp sp particularly from the north and the east, they're the cold quarters where you can get very cold winds, especially in the spring. So you've got to make sure that your location has good light and a bit of shelter. And the tools that are necessary aren't many. I mean, a, a good rake, a hoe, which we saw earlier, a hand cultivator with prongs, which will break up the top of the soil, a fork and a spade, and a trowel. Um, it's very simple really, uh, and if you're actually just gardening on a very small scale, then the fewer tools are needed. Thank you. 
first uh, part of the four year rotation is potatoes. They're planted in late March, early April, following an overwintering crop of trefoil. And compost is also turned in with the trefoil. About two weeks later, the potatoes are planted and they're earthed up. This stops the potatoes greening and helps to hold the moisture. A little bit of uh, hoeing and weeding is necessary during the season and you know that they're about to um, tuber up about three weeks after they've flowered. You're ready to start digging the earlies. Um, hopefully they get plenty of moisture during this period. We grow about five or six varieties here. Um, Red Duke of York is an early and Desiree and Pink Fur Apple and there are others. And then after the potatoes, we follow with another green manure crop when they've been harvested. Well, we're to year two in the rotation cycle, and that's the legumes. Uh, peas, mange two, broad beans, and climbing French beans and runner beans. I particularly recommend runner beans because they're a very high yielding plant. They're very good for the vertical layer that we produce. They don't take up a huge amount of space for the crops that you get. And in a good summer, if they're given plenty of moisture, they would do really well. If you have small amount of space, then a, then a wigwam tripod shape is, is better. You can get that into a small little square. Um, and, 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 and grow them up, up the sticks. I use hazel sticks, but you can get bamboo. It's whatever you can get hold of. Um, they need to be secured well, because once they get full of foliage, they can become a bit of a wind, wind trap. So I actually put stakes in and, and tie the post to wires, just for stability. Um, but they're very, very, very good um, return for, for your space. Crop three in the rotation cycle is brassicas, which is Brussels sprouts, kale, the broccolis, cabbages. Um, they can take up a bit of space, um, but if you have the space, they're a most nutritious family of plants. Very nutritious and very rewarding. And you can have crops over a long period, particularly with Brussels, you know, we're talking about months of yields. They benefit from the previous year's legumes, and if you've been able to find some space, say after you've cleared broad beans and peas, you can actually sow a green manure, and that will overwinter and you turn them in, which is what I did here this year with the brassicas. Some problems with brassicas can be pigeons. Um, for most places, even in urban situations, there are pigeons, so they'll need netting to start with to stop them being chomped. Uh, when they get to a certain size, they're usually fine. And then, then there's the good old cabbage white butterfly, which is probably really the only real problem pest we get here at Holywell. And the, the cabbage white can be stopped pretty much almost totally by fleece. You can put fleece over the crops. And fleece is very successful in dealing with that. You can also um, intercrop the brassicas, particularly the brussels, with um, the lettuces, quick growing lettuces, uh, radishes, as an intercrop. So you're making maximum use of that space in between. Um, but they, they need good soil, they're a good indicator of the fertility of your soil, particularly the nitrogen levels. But we know that this is where green manures work because when you follow, a, say, a trefoil crop with, with brassicas, they look very, very healthy, they do very, very well. We grow about half a dozen varieties of uh, brassicas here, but if you haven't got a lot of space, the one that I would recommend would be the broccolis. Just a handful of plants will give you a very nutritious vegetable in a small area.
Year four in the crop rotation routes. This could be carrots, beetroot, onions, leeks, celeriac, whatever you, you want to grow. They will follow the brassicas. They need the least amount of nutrients. A certain amount of soil preparation, just turning the soil a little bit after the brassicas is necessary just to loosen the soil a bit. And then direct sowing can take place. With carrots, I sow thinly because you do have um, a problem called the carrot fly for carrots, and that comes in low and will pick up the smell if you have to thin the carrots later. So sow them thinly, and a physical barrier is a solution to the carrot fly as well. A mesh, perimeter of mesh around the, um, the carrots can, 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 can do it, because it comes in low from the side. Or a tall crop nearby would also confuse it. And the roots finish our four year uh, rotation, and then we're into sowing another green manure for the next year's following crop of potatoes again. Another crop to consider, which uh, doesn't involve a lot of labour and not even a huge amount of space, is the Raspberry Autumn Bliss. This is a raspberry that starts to produce its fruit after the summer raspberries, from about August onwards, depending on how warm the situation is and where you are in the country. And it crops over a very long period of time. And the advantage of the Autumn Bliss raspberry is that it doesn't need netting. The birds are no longer interested in it by then, late in the season, and you'll get um, net-free crops. You don't even have to put the post and wires up either. You may need to put up a little bit of post and support because of the weight of the, the berries on the end of the stems. But it actually is a very good soft fruit crop to consider. Very nutritious, easy to freeze with surpluses and over a long period. So that's the Autumn Bliss Raspberry. Another area to consider in your growing space, and particularly in an urban situation, is walls and fences. The south wall is well known for being a warm wall, and you could grow exotics like figs, apricots and grapes on a south facing wall, and it'd be a good place for outdoor tomatoes. The east and west facing walls will take a lot more examples. You could grow pears and apples. But if all you have is a north facing wall, then even here, crops could be grown, like a gauges, cherries, currants, and even raspberries if you get a reasonable amount of light, particularly in the morning. Well, I hope this has empowered you and inspired you to uh, grow your own because for me, in the last couple of decades, it's certainly obvious to me this is the way forward. We need to produce our food more locally, in our own backyards. We can have more control over what we grow and eat. We know how it's been grown. It's not um, grown afar 
and uh, manipulated. So we actually know what we're actually growing and eating. We're in, in control of that. Um, stock free is the solution to a lot of the conventional growing's problems, but we know that it works. I know that in the two decades that I've been practicing stock free organic methods of growing, that it's worked for me and I really hope it works for you too.